So welcome all again to the, uh, the final lecture in the series on recurrent neural networks. Again, as I just mentioned, this class is the last in the series. And so because I want to wrap up the topic, I may actually go 10, maybe 15 or even 20 minutes over. So those of you who absolutely need to leave at the end of the class may leave. But those of you who can stay, I, I encourage you to stay and uh, go and uh, stay through the lecture. And even if you must go, I, I encourage you to stay for at least an extra five minutes to catch as, catch as much as you can. This is going to be a feature not just in this week's quiz, but also very prominently in homework form. So here is our sequence to sequence modeling problem again. We are given an input sequence x1 through xn of some length n, and we want to compute an output sequence y1 through yn. For example, speech recognition. Speech goes in and a word sequence comes out. Or machine translation. A word sequence goes in, another comes out. And that's the same for dialogue. And in general, there is no, uh, there is no need for the length of the input and output sequences to be the same or even for there to be any kind of observable correspond obvious observable correspondence between the input and output sequences. We saw different cases of this problem. In problems like speech recognition, where speech goes in and a transcription comes out, there is order correspondence between the input and the output. We dealt with in the, in the past couple of classes. In machine translation, you don't find this order correspondence. For example, I ate an apple is input in English, and the translated output in German is Ich habe einen Apfel gegessen. The input and output orders may be mixed up, and you may not even have a one to one correspondence. So, I in English is the first word, and the corresponding Ich is the first word in German as well, but eight splits into habe gegessen. So two words, uh, one at the beginning of the sentence and the other at the end of the sentence. So you see the, uh, there is no order correspondence. And you can even have this case where, like a dialogue where the input and output are not even related. So the input could be a user typing, my screen is blank. And the system must respond with, please check if your computer is plugged in. The two are apparently unrelated. But all of these are sequence to sequence problems. We've talked about this case in the last class where the input and output are order aligned, but not time synchronous. We developed the entire CTC framework to deal with it. So today we'll talk about this case where we cannot really assume a direct mapping between the input and output, like in, the tra like in translation or even dialogue. So in the case of dialogue, for instance, there isn't, there isn't even a regular relationship between the input and output, let alone their, their, uh, their lens. And the model may, must be able to perform these conversions. As a preliminary, we will first recap a related problem, predicting text. So here we are given a sequence of symbols, characters or words, and must predict the next symbol in the sequence. So given W1 through WN, we must predict WN plus one. Now recall that this is basically the problem of language modeling, learning the sequential structure of language. So that given a, a sequence of words or characters, we can predict the next word, a go or character M. And we can model this with a recurrent net, net that takes in sequences of symbols and outputs the next symbol in the sequence. So it takes in W0 through say W2, it must output W3. In general, it takes in W0 to WK. It must output WK, the next symbol, WK plus one. Of course, there's the engineering side of it. We represent symbols as one hot vectors whose dimension is the same as the vocabulary of the symbols. Then we project it down to a lower dimension of embedding before we work on them. The network itself is typically several layers deep of, with units like LSTMs. The output layer, 
actually produces a probability distribution over the vocabulary at each time with the objective that the probability of the next actual next symbol in the sequence is the highest in the, in the distribution computed over here. And so the output at any time is, the, is basically the output of the network at any time is basically the probability distribution over all symbols given all inputs until that time. To train the model, we minimize the divergence between the output distribution and the one hot vector for the target symbol, which is the next symbol. And we sum this over all time. And for one hot representations of the tar target, if you use the callback leibler divergence between the output and the uh, target output, then the overall divergence simply becomes the uh, sum over all time of the negative of the log of the probability assigned to the target word, which is the correct next word at each time. And we train the network to minimize this divergence. So we've seen all of this. And now we come to the most important part that is relevant to today's lecture. That is generating language from the model. Once we have a trained model, we can use it to generate text. We provide the initial few symbols, say the words W1, W2, and W3. And again, these are going to be presented as one hot vectors which are projected down. After the last word is input, the network will output a probability distribution over all the words in the vocabulary. We will now sample a word from this probability distribution. I assume all of you know how to draw a sample from a category distribution. If not, please read up about, read up about it. So the sample word is going to be our prediction for the next word, W4. And we will input that generated word, W4, W4 here, as the next word in the sequence to the network. In response, the network will output a probability distribution for W5. And we will draw our actual predicted W5 by sampling from this distribution, which we will feed back into the net as the next word. And for, at which point it will produce the next distribution from which we sample the next word. We can continue this process to produce more and more words in the sequence. When do we stop this generation and decide that the output is complete? Because clearly this process can go on and on, but there has to be a stop. When do we stop it? Just looking at a sequence of words, you cannot know if it is from the start of a sentence, the middle of a sentence, the end of a sentence, or a complete sentence all by itself. Consider the sequence of words, four score and eight. Looking at it, can you say which part of a sentence it is? I could just be saying four score and year eight years ago, in which case it is at the start of the sentence. Or I could say the sum is four score and eight, in which case it's going to be the end of a sentence. Or it could just be in the middle of a longer sentence. So we need some way of disambiguating, of knowing where in the sentence this sequence of word occurs. So to clarify and, and uh, make it explicit where sentences start and end, we will add two additional symbols in addition to the regular words in the vocabulary to the base vocabulary. So we're going to add this symbol to our vocabulary with SOS, which indicates the start of a sentence. We're also going to add this second word to the vocabulary, EOS, which indicates the end of a sentence. And we will insert an SOS before the first word in a sentence. And any complete sentence will be terminated by EOS. So to see how we use SOS and EOS, let's see some examples. Four score and eight. There is no SOS or EOS over here. So clearly this is the middle of a sentence. Now here, SOS, four score and eight. So this is start of sentence, four score and eight. This has the start of sentence marker. So this is a fragment from the start of a sentence. 
four is the actual first word. Or this one, four score and eight US, or US is the end of sentence marker. So this is the end of a sentence, and the actual final word in the sentence is eight. Or this one, start of sentence, four score and eight, end of sentence. This has both SOS and EOS. So this is a complete sentence starting at four and ending at eight. In situations where the start of the sequence is obvious, the SOS may not be needed, but the end of a sentence must always be tagged. So EOS is always required to terminate sentences. And sometimes we will just use a common symbol for both SOS and EOS. So you might just have one symbol representing both the start of a sentence and the end of a sentence, which could just be something like S. So we have our first poll over here. And let me launch it. Ten seconds, guys. All right, let me stop it. So, only the first choice is a complete sentence. It has a start of sentence, hello world, end of sentence. The second one is the next start of sentence. The third one, third one is just the end of a sentence. The fourth one is the middle of a sentence. A complete sentence will both ha have both the SOS and the EOS markers. The only situation where the SOS marker may not be used is where it's, it's obviously the start of a sentence. That situation doesn't hold in this problem. So now returning to our problem, uh, we will continue to generate word after word after word after word after word until we have generated generated an end of sentence marker. And when we have finally, and again by generated, we, I mean we've drawn, randomly drawn an end of sentence marker from the output distribution. So when we have finally generated an end, end of sentence marker, we will decide that the sentence is complete and terminate generation. So remember this process, you're going to use it. Now going back to sequence to sequence modeling without input output synchrony of any kind, we will model the problem with the network with, with this kind of structure, the delayed sequence to sequence model. The model has two components. The first component is this portion of the model, which processes the input. And at the end of the input, it generates a hidden representation which is this box for the entire sentence. So I have some pseudocode over here. We loop through time, recurrently computing the hidden state. The final output is the hidden, the hidden state at the final time. That's the final output. And that is the hidden representation of the sentence. Once we compute this hidden rep representation, we can use it to generate the output using the same procedure that we saw before for generating language. So here is pseudocode again. Here we got the hidden representation for the input. Next, we run the loop. And at each time, we first run an RNN step that uses the current hidden representation to, com to compute the recurrent hidden representation and also the output probability distribution uh, for the next word. And the next word itself is drawn from this output probability distribution. We will continue this generation process until we draw an end of sentence or end of sequence marker. This is the important bit over here. The network actually outputs a probability distribution for the next word, and we are going to select or sample the actual next word from this distribution. 
Now, the problem here is that the recurrence is only over the hidden states. It doesn't actually consider the, 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 the word that you actually drew from the probability distribution. Although the output is obtained from the hidden state, the output distribution is obtained from the hidden state, the, the actual word that we put out is computed using an additional step, which is that of sampling from this distribution. And the information about which word we actually pulled out of this distribution is not utilized when you compute the next hidden state. So let's say the output assigns, this distribution assigns equal probabilities to A and N. If we draw an A, the choice of words at the next time should be different than if we draw an N. Ideally, if we draw an A over here, the net should assign higher probabilities to words that begin with consonants at the next term. Whereas if we draw an N over here, it should assign higher probabilities to vowel words. But here, since the word that we draw is not known to the network at the next time, the output distribution at the next time will be the same, regardless of whether the word we chose from this distribution was an A or an N. So this problem is also apparent from the pseudocode. Here is the problem again. The output is Y out, and the actual Y out does not go back into this recurrent step. The recurrent step only considers the hidden state produced at the previous time. So regardless of whether I drew the, drew the word A or whether the, I, I drew the word N, the probability of dark at the next time step is going to remain same, uh, although and dark is not a, not, a, not a likely combination, whereas a dark is a likely combination. And this happens because the RNN recurs recursion step over here only takes the hidden state from the previous time and doesn't consider the actual word that we output. So we'll fix that will change our model slightly. Now, in addition to this local recurrence within the hidden layer, we will also take in as output the, the last word that was actually produced by sampling from or drawing from the output distribution. So this model is now changed. The output is an output distribution, but there's a next step from which we get in which we get a word from that distribution that is fed back into this. And so our actual model is going to have an extra arrow coming from here and going here because the word that is drawn from here goes back here. The word that's drawn from here goes back here and so on. So this figure here represents this process. You have the encoder. The encoder computes a hidden state. Then the decoder has, uses this hidden state to produce the output distribution. Uh, the, no, because the hidden state only says, only encodes the probability distribution that was output at the previous time. It doesn't encode the actual word that was selected from the distribution. So the hidden representation can regenerate the distribution, but not the word. The process of drawing a word from that distribution is an extra step that isn't considered by the hidden state in the usual form, right? Did that answer your question? Yeah, okay. So this is our simple translation model. I'm call it, calling it a translation model because it translates an input to an output. And I'll use language translate translation as an example of this. It has two parts. The first part is this recurrent structure we feed it an input sequence and the input must have a definite termination. So if the input is a sequence of words, it must terminate with an end of sentence marker. The hidden activation at the final output is assumed to carry all the information about the entire input sequence. Thereafter, the, a second RNN uses the final hidden activation from the input as the initial hidden state. 
it takes in the sudden state and an initial startup symbol marker and recurrently generates new words. So at each time, the, the uh, uh, hidden state is computed from the previous hidden state and the previous output word to produce subsequent words. So for the output at the first time, it takes in the final hidden input state and a start of symbol marker and outputs a probability distribution over words from which you would say you would draw one word, say ish. The input is I eat an apple, end of sentence marker. You feed it a start of some sentence marker and this hidden state, it produces a distribution from which you draw a word, which could mean say ish. At the next time, we input that ish along with this hidden state of a recurrent hidden state. And you get the next output distribution from which you draw the next word and draw and then repeat this process. That word and this hidden state is fed into the network. It produces the next output distribution from you from which you from which you from which you from which you draw the next word and keep repeating this process until we output an end of sentence symbol. And when this happens, we stop. Now observe something here. If I had drawn a different word over here, say do instead of ish, then the word going in at the next time over here would be do instead of ish. And so the next output probability distribution would be different. And so the word you drew from it would be different and every subsequent word would be different. Now, just a warning. In my figures, I'm showing a single hidden layer, but in practicality, there could be any number of hidden layers and the basic idea would remain the same. So you could, although my figures look like this, the network could look far more complex, something like this, but even much more complex. However, for my illustrations, I'm going to stay with this simple figure. So here is the modified pseudocode. Now, this is the same pseudocode as before, but in the RNN recursion, there's one minor change. Instead of only inputting the previous hidden state, we are actually inputting, also inputting the actual word that was drawn at the previous time. And so that means that the next distribution also depends on the word that you specifically selected at the previous time. Now, so drawing a different word over here is going to change the input here to this recurrent step at the next time, and it will also change the output at the next step. Now, there are two parts to the model here that do different things. The first part reads the entire input and encodes it into this hidden representation. So we will call this first part the encoder. The second part reads this hidden representation and uses it to unravel the output. So in other words, it decodes this hidden representation into the output. So we will call this the decoder. Now, Gladys, we'll get to that. That's a very good question. Now, Let's take a closer look at the decoding process again. First, the inputs are represented as one hot vectors that are mapped into lower dimensional embeddings. And the embeddings may be learned along with the rest of the net or be pre-computed. In either case, I will not be explicitly showing this embedding, uh, this matrix in the rest of the slides. One thing to note, the input and output vocabularies may be different. For example, the input is English, the output is German. And so the projection matrices for the input and output can be entirely different. In, in general, they will actually be different. Uh, so you're, Fan, you're asking essentially the same question as Glass, and it's a very nice question. I'll get to that in a little while, right? In fact, very shortly. We have said so far, that the output of the decoder at any time is a probability distribution over symbols. I'll assume there are words here, just to explain. What exactly is this distribution? The distribution output by the net is the probability distribution of the next word 
given the entire input and all words so far. So this one over here is actually the probability of word one given the input, which is the, the entire English and the SOS startup subjects. So that's what this distribution is at the first time. And so when I draw uh, this word from it, I'm actually drawing a, a, a word from this distribution. And the next time, the probability distribution that I get, this is actually going to be the probability distribution for word two, given the entire input, which is, you know, I ate an apple and EOS ish. So this is because ish and EOS have both been input over here. This is the probability distribution of the next word, given that the first two symbols in the output sequence were EOS and ish. So at each time, as I keep going down, the actual probability distribution that I compute is the distribution of the next word given the entire input and all the words that have been output until that time. So, and from that, we're going to draw the next word and we're going to continue this process to the end of sequence symbol is drawn. And so the overall process is at each time, the network produces a probability distribution of our words given the entire input and the entire output sequence so far. And at each time, a word is drawn from this output distribution and that drawn word is provided as input to the next time. The process is continued to the uh, end of sentence marker is drawn. Now all through this process, discussion, I have, I have used this term, draw a word from a distribution. So what exactly is this process of drawing a word from the distribution? This should answer the questions, that's questions that, that just came up. Now the probability of the complete output sequence, including the end of sentence marker, given the input. So this is the probability of the complete output sentence given the input, which is P of O1 through OL, given inputs I1 through IN, can be decomposed using Bayes' rule as P of O1 given the inputs times P of O2 given O1 and the inputs times P of O3 given O1, O2 and the inputs and so on, right? And what is this guy? P of O1 given the inputs is simply the probability distribution over here. P of O2 given O1, or rather the P of O1 given the inputs is the probability of O1 read from this distribution over here. P of O2 given O1 and the inputs is the probability is the probability of O2, which has been read from this distribution over here, because this distribution is the probability of the second word, given that the first word was O1 and the inputs, right? And so each of these terms is a probability read from one of the columns of this table. And so when we perform sequence to sequence conver or conversion, what we want to do is to output the most probable output sequence given the input, right? Which is to say we want to obtain the output sequence such that the product of the y's when the out when the uh, when the output sequence the words in the output sequence go back into the input as shown over here we want to find the output sequence such for which the product of these y's is maximum so o3 is dependent on o1 and o2 o4 is dependent on o1 o2 and o3 it's a chain right so if you keep feeding things back, the sequence of symbols is going to have an output, pro each symbol is going to have a probability. And you want to find the sequence of symbols such that 
the output sequence that you get has the highest probability. So this is the objective we want to satisfy. And so how do we draw these O1, O, you know, these O1, O2, O3 to OL such that the product of their probabilities is maximum? The greedy answer is just, you know, as Gladys mentioned, just select the most probable symbol at each time. Select the most probable symbol at time O1, feed that back in. Select the most probable symbol at the next time, feed that back in, and so on. So over here, this operation, where we say, you know, if I go back here, this operation where we said draw draw word from yt, I can just replace that by r max i yti, which is to say, pick the word which has the highest probability. Always select the most probable output. The problem is because every output depends on all the previous outputs, simply drawing the most probable uh, symbol at each time doesn't guarantee that the overall uh, output is going to be is going to be the most probable output. Picking the most probable word at any time may cause the network to become more confused and less certain about what follows in subsequent time steps. So that even the most probable outputs at the future times have lower probability than they would have had if we had chosen a different, less probable word at the current time. So to understand, consider this hypothetical example. This would be say for a speech recognition task. Say, based on our inputs, we found the most probable first word to be he. Then for the next word, uh, over here, the word nose, the nose is, the, is, is that organ on your face, was assigned the next highest probability. And the word knows with a K, which sounds much the same, was assigned nearly the same, but slightly lower probability. So you've chosen the most probable words in each, for here. And here you've chosen the most probable word here, and this is with a slightly lower uh, the, uh, the word knows, which has a lower probability than knows. But then what is the word that can follow he knows with the, with the you know, organ on your face as the second word? He knows is a very, very strange combination of words. There's no clear word, obvious word that can follow. And so in this situation, you'd expect the network to be very confused about what the next word must be and assign low probabilities to all the words. Whereas if you have he knows, although he knows had a slightly lower probability than he knows, for the next word, this is a well-structured pair of words. So, you know, a word like something is going to have a very high probability and the other words are clearly absurd. So when you compare the probability, the product of the probabilities of the first three words, this guy, is clearly going to win over this guy. And so, does that make sense to you guys? Everyone? Very nice question, right? Let me address that as well. So, and the problem is here, when you are generating the second word for the output, you don't know a priori that it, you know, it, that uh, although it had the higher probability in the second position, it will cause future confusion. So here you're sort of in this example, you're reading it as a human. You know that nose is a worse, worse choice than knows. But algorithmically speaking, the model doesn't know that. So it's no way, it has no way of knowing that just because it chose nose, the thing on your face over here, the, the, there are going to be confusions downstream. And in fact, the confusions may not even occur immediately afterwards. The confusions may be spread out and choosing a wrong word early may lead to an overall poor cumulative score over time uh, due to in increased confusion for several steps downstream. So for instance, here, 
say the word that had the higher the, the say in the first example let's say the word he had the higher probability but the word the had almost the same probability but slightly lower so then over here choosing he and choosing knows made a really lousy combination but choosing the lower probability d knows is a perfectly acceptable combination which can have higher prob probability overall and in fact this can affect what happens in the third word immediately he knows and this is going to be de demolished right whereas the fact that you chose d in the first first position gave you a much clearer probability distribution in the third step so what this means is that you cannot even predict how far out your poor choice is going to affect you in general making a poor choice at any time commits us to a poor future but the problem is you you cannot know beforehand that you have made a poor choice when you make it so we have this problem that a bad choice at any time can cause things to go bad downstream so how do we know what to choose at each time one solution is to simply punt on the problem and say i'm not going to worry about it i'm just going to randomly select the word from the output distribution so at each time the network outputs a distribution and you just sample a word randomly and feed it as the input at the next time like we did for language generation and so this operation over here which was draw now becomes sample which is to say randomly sample from the output distribution yt random sampling however is almost certainly not going to give you an optimal decode which results in the highest probability output it will generally not give you the higher overall most likely output but strangely enough when you perform a random decode of this kind you will often get an output whose overall probability is actually higher than the output you would get if you perform greedy decoding by choosing the most likely word at each time so which kind of seems odd but random decoding can actually end up giving you a higher overall probability than greedy decoding so anyway let's uh, look at the i have a poem Ten seconds, guys. Empirically, Jerry, the first one is is true. For greedy decoding, we choose the most likely word. when you have random sampling we randomly choose the next word according to the probability assigned by the decoder and you know what i haven't actually shown you how to randomly sample anything from a distribution so if you've been paying attention you'd realize that this third is this hidden thing that i haven't explained and i said early on just look it up so the first two are right and the last one is wrong last one is false Anyway, so here's the problem. Your choice can, your choices can get you stuck. The entire problem arises from the fact that making a choice at any time can result in a in poor future outputs, and we don't know at the time of choosing that this choice was poor. So here we couldn't know at this point, for instance, that drawing he is going to cause problems two words down the line, for instance. so the solution just don't choose 
keep them all and select the most likely at the end. So at output time one, instead of selecting one word from the output distribution, fork the network, make as many copies of the decoder as there are words and input one word to each of these copies. And when you fork it on this arrow, you would store the probability of D that was computed at this time. On this edge, you would, you would store the probability of V. So on each of these edges, you can store the probability of the word that's going in. Now, so here, if we have a vocabulary of four words, I'm, I'm going to make four copies of the decoder and each of them gets a different word as input. All of them also get the recurrent state over here as input. So this arrow actually says that this recurrent state is being passed down to this, uh, to the hidden state of the next time. Then at the next time, each of these guys is going to output a probability distribution. So for each of them, we make as many copies of the network as there are words, and then input a different word to each of them. All copies of this network will get their hidden state from the parent. And, and you're going to also store along this path the probability of the word that was going in at this time. Basically, what we are doing here is that we are generating the entire tree of possible word sequences so that we can choose the most likely one. Now, what's the problem with this going to be? Anyone? Um, poor performance. It's just going to blow up, right? Uh, so again, so Jero, if you if you feed in the probability distribution, it doesn't tell the network which word you actually chose. And you guys have found the problem and the solution, right? The solution is to prune at each time, retain only the top k scoring folks. But then the when I say top k scoring, the scores must be based on the entire sequence of words and not just the latest word. So at time one, I'm going to have V branches where V is the vocabulary. Each of them represents a different word and is going to have a probability associated with it, which is the probability of the word that went in. Then of these, I will choose only the top K and retain only those top K. And then I grow, I grow only the surviving branches by making V children for every one of them. And then I'm going to prune out all but the top K branches. So here I've chosen K equals two. I had two V, two V leaves over here. I have pruned out everything except two of them. Now the score that I use for pruning is not going to be just the local probability of these words, but the product of the entire path of the probabilities along the entire path from this point to the leaf. So the probability over here is going to be the probability of P out here times the probability of I out here. This one is going to be the probability of he times the probability of nose and so on. So you're going to choose the top K word pairs. So when you choose the top K path, uh, the, the top K leaves over here, the score that you use is going to be the probability of the entire word sequence. This is exactly beam search. Except now you're going to be decomposing these probabilities. So as you keep going down, you will actually use the product of the probabilities along the entire path from the root to the leaf and prune according to the product. And then once we retain just these two, we would expand those again. Each of them is going to have V children. Those V children will all have a probability where the probability of any child is going to be the product of the probabilities of all the words on the path to the child. So again, this the probability of P here is computed here. The probability of nose here is computed here. The probability of whatever went in here is computed here. So you're going to have all of these children 
do not fall by the top two and keep doing this. And uh, basically keep expanding the paths and expand it again and again. And at each point, the score used for pruning is the overall path score obtained by multiplying the probabilities computed by the net for all the words in the path. Now, the path probabilities can in fact be incrementally computed since we use Bayes rule to write it as the product of the probabilities of individual words given all the input in the previous output words. So when we extend the partial path to any node in this tree by one more symbol to get the probability for the extended path, we only have to, we will already have a partial path score at this point. So the or better explain here, right? I'm going to have a partial path score for both, both of these nodes. So when I expand it out, there's just going to be one additional multiply to compute all of these scores. Each time I expand it, I'm going to multiply one more term to the probabilities I have over here before I choose the top k. I'm going to continue to generate words in this manner till the current overall most likely path ends in an end of sentence marker. Now, we won't necessarily stop as soon as we hit an EOS. In fact, we're going to get an end of sentence marker at each time because we always expand the path paths with all the words in our vocabulary, including the end of sentence marker. One of the things that happens is that you are you never extend a path once you generate an end of sentence marker. So so long as you continue extending this tree, keeping the top k at each time, if you output an end of sentence marker, but the other paths have higher probabilities, this path will terminate over here, but these paths will continue to expand. And you will only stop when you have a path ending in an end of sentence marker, which is the highest overall probability. So that leads to something, it leads to an imbalance in the structure. For example, let's say over here, the, the path probability this, to this end of sentence marker was 0.1. And this path probability was 0.2. So I expanded it and expanded it. And then when I got here, this path was say 0.18 because every time you expand it, the probability goes down and say this was 0.16. And say now finally, when you get here, this is say 0.09 and this is say 0.12. And then this becomes 0.08 and say this becomes 0 0.07, 0 0.09. So what happens over here? As you keep expanding the paths, these probabilities are continuously going down, but then when you got here, the most likely part that ended up with an end of sentence marker was way up in the beginning. So this ends up being your most likely word sequence. So you get this imbalance of parts where you cannot really predict which of all of the terminations that you have seen so far is the most likely. So, so this causes uh, certain uh, problems with the decoding logic that often needs some empirical tuning to sort out. So play, if the kth path, kth path terminates, are we keeping a new path in the beam? No, so it's, this is just going to continue expanding. If this was in the top k. Again, these are heuristic choices because the effect is going to be minimal on the overall, uh, overall uh, output. So, let me have the next poll. Okay, 10 seconds, guys.
So, so Jerry, you're, you're, you're right. And so often we end up having to employ heuristics about minimum length, minimal length for the output or penalties on the length of the output and such like. Because if you just use this process in this basic form, it does encourage the network to terminate as early as possible. Now, this is correct. Theoretically correct decoding requires you to evaluate the entire tree representing every possible word sequence to select the best one. Beam search is not theoretically correct. Why is it not theoretically correct? Because anytime you uh, prune, then as, as we are doing over here, right? You have no guarantee that the overall most likely path was not an extension of one of these guys. And because you don't have that guarantee, the, uh, by the mere act of pruning, you're losing any guarantee of optimality. So beam search is not theoretically optimal, but it's a pretty good approximation because it's really hard to not to do this without uh, pruning. I have some pseudocode for beam search over here. Take a look. So any questions so far? Uh, could you go back uh, two slides? To Which slide? To the graph where you wrote out the probabilities. Yeah. yeah. Um, so actually, um, in the right lower corner, uh, does it mean that, um, like, when exactly do you stop the uh, generating more forks? I do not understand. The point. So you stop generating more for, okay, some heuristics go into this, but in theory, you stop generating more forks when you get a word sequence that terminates in an end of sentence marker that has the highest probability. But, okay. Right? But so, so, so zero point zero eight, you stop there because because zero point one back here became high, ended up having a higher score. Oh, so there's no chance of overtaking it anymore because exactly. Oh, I see. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Uh, professor, I have a question. So essentially, yeah, um. Yeah, so essentially at each step, we actually have to keep the network and then feed it in, uh, feed, feed the, uh, the, the word of choice into the network and then continue. So we cannot I'm sorry, the whole can, you, sorry, can you come closer to your mic? Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, so at each time step, we, uh, time step we, we actually have to keep the network and feed the word of choice into the network instead of so, letting the, the network run and then um, so, so, so we are not feeding a word of choice. We are feeding every word into the network. That's why I'm making yeah. many copies of the network. Right? right. And so, and so what I'm really doing is I'm feeding every word into the network, but, I, but before even, I'm not actually going to explicitly do this. I'm going to retain the top K words and feed only those top K words into the network. These guys don't get expanded, right? Then at the next time, although I've drawn this figure, I'm going to find the top K word pairs and then only feed the second word, I mean, feed those words back in and extend the network out here. So then here, I'm going to have word triplets. I'm going to choose the top K word triplets and retain only the highest scoring ones and choose and feed that last word back into the network. Did that answer yeah, your question? Yeah, I would, yes, I was thinking whether we can do it statically, but it looks like, yeah, we cannot do that. We have to uh, run the network. Okay. Professor, so, I have a question too. Yeah, just. Uh, uh, can, can we consider that all of the branches are uh, uh, being computed in parallel over here? So they're not, so no. So this is what is happening. This. These are all being computed in parallel, right? Yes. Then these are all being computed in parallel. Yes. Then these are all being computed in parallel. Yes. Can I answer so your question? 
Uh, yes, but in in case of uh, we discussed two three lectures before that uh, sometimes uh, source language uh, uh, the language which we are translating in may take uh, way more words than correct. Uh, so 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 you are just assuming that this decoding process will finally give you a most likely word sequence. Observe that the number of times you go through this has nothing to do with the number of words here. Yeah, but uh, the uh, first. Uh, the upper upper branch uh, I was saying, which uh, got cut uh, at just three three instances over here, we can see, right? Mm -hmm. Just assuming that it get cuts uh, at very uh, minimal when comparing compared to other branches, and as Manish said, uh, if it encourages uh, getting cut at uh, at lower lower instances than the other branches, then it would go wrong, right? Correct. So this is an, again, because, so I said in theory, right? In practice, it's never going to work so yeah, nicely. Yeah. So, so you're going to end up having to use heuristics to clean up. Yeah, okay. I, thank you. You're both correct. And heuristics will be required. So I'm kind of, let me move on, right? So if it needs, is it is it possible to not have an EOS produced by the network? That's not the case, right? Uh, because you're always getting an EOS at every time. It's highly unlikely that you will get a situation where the EOS or the probability of EOS is always zero. If you get that, then there's something wrong with the model. Either that or your language consists of only of infinitely long sentences. Yeah, okay. Right? Yeah. Heuristics just during the print, the, during the decoding, you would have, you can, you can say you can uh, favor you can uh, say the length must be at least this much. The length cannot be greater than this much. These are other kinds of things you can try. Mm -hmm. right. So once on any path, right? So, all right, let me continue. Now, so we know how to perform inference with the model, but how do we train it? We have to train it to make the right predictions. So the English to German translator must be able to take an I ate an apple and correctly act output fish harbor and an apple gigas. So how do you teach the net to do this? Our training data is going to consist of input sequences and target output sequences. As always, we will initialize your network and use gradient descent. To compute gradient, the gradient on each training instance, we will first perform a forward pass. But now there is a key difference between uh, how we perform the forward pass in the models we saw earlier and how we and how we will do it here. So typically, the way you did it, you had an input and you had this network as a black box and you computed the output or if you have a network as a you know box it just computed the output the input went in once right the uh, issue is so so the forward pass was exactly the same as inference and the desired output never figured in the forward pass right so what would what that means is that to train this network properly you would be inputting this guy, you'd be getting some output, and then you'd be computing the divergence between this output and your desired output and back propagating the error. But if you just do this in the simple naive manner, you, know, you would run into a huge problem. There is no guarantee that the output is going to be anything related to your input. It may differ in length, it may differ in all kinds of ways. It will be really hard to compute, you know, your target output may be hello world, and with your initial output or your target output may be Ishabayan and Apfel Gehesen. But when you initialize the model, uh, the output could be some other random blah, 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 right? So how do you compute a divergence between Ishabayan and Apfel Gehesen and blah, 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 blah? Okay, you really cannot. It becomes challenging. So what we will do is we will perform a trick. In the forward pass, we will actually feed in 
as an input the desired output. So this is a form of cheating in that this is no longer your standard inference. For inference during training, uh, the, uh, the uh, desired output is also going to be uh, fed into the network. So this is a key difference between how we perform forward pass here and how we did it in the past. So as a result, this is, and having this extra desired input provides it guidance and we will see how this really matters. Now, when you're performing the decoding, you get some output over here, some output distribution over here, but as, instead of randomly drawing a word from here and put it and feeding it over here, the word that you will feed it over here is the actual word that you wanted output over here. Now, remember, that in a prop, during proper inference, this information is not going to be given to you, right? This is the true output that you want. So here, the, the word you will feed in over here is ish, which is the actual word that you wanted output here. The word that you feed in here is going to be harbor, which is the actual output that you wanted fed in over here. And so the, the uh, benefit of doing this is that now you're guaranteed that the number of outputs is exactly the same as the number of outputs you want. So when I, when I perform decoding in this manner, the number of outputs over here is going to be the same as the number of words in my target output. And so now I'm going to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between these output distributions and my target output words, and I can compute it divergence. And so because of that, because of the way we perform the inference, we will have exactly as many outputs from the decoder as the number of uh, words in the target output. And we can compute the divergence between the two, which will be the sum of the local callback library divergences. And we can back propagate this derivative of this divergence through the net to compute gradients for gradient descent. Now in practice, so did this make sense guys? The distinction between what we are doing here and your standard forward. So but, the key difference, um, here, yeah. But when we are doing, for example, random hex generation, right? So how do we know what's the target sequence? Because- So again, for training, this is what we will do. For training, you're going to always feed in the, the target here. But during the generation, you're not going to have this. Right? This is teacher for so, so for training, we'll have a complete paragraph that's making sense, right? For training, you'll have sentences, words, paragraphs that have made that make sense. Okay, okay. Right? Yeah. So in practice, and if we use SGD for training, we wouldn't compute divergences at every time, but randomly select words from the target output, typically only one word, compute divergences there and back propagate. So for example, here, we are only computing the divergence at the word gegesen and back propagating that to the network. So overall in each iteration, we randomly select a training instance for what for, perform the forward pass with this extra information being provided, randomly select a word, compute the, the divergence, compute its derivatives, and back, perform back drop. So the overall procedure is we're given several training instances consisting of input and target output sequences. For each training instance in a mini batch, in the forward pass, we compute the output of the network in response to the input and the target output, we need both. Then in the backward pass, we compute the divergence between the words that you chose from the output and the corresponding words in the, in the target output and propagate the derivatives backwards for updates and update parameters. Now, the model that I just showed you is what I'm calling simple sequence to sequence conversion. 
what we actually do is somewhat more fancy. As I promised you, this class is going to go 10 minutes over, so we will have time for it. So, but let's look at applications, machine translation. The input is in English, the output is in a different language. So, you know, my name is Tom and the output is Ishai Tom. My name is Tom. Or speech recognition, you get a speech recording in, the output is my name is Tom. Or dialogue systems, the input is the user's input, the output is the system response. Or you can even have image captioning where you have an input image and the output is its caption. So now there's some more examples on the slides which I'm not showing. But first, let's consider the hidden representations learned by the deep encoder for the input. This is the representation that's unraveled by the decoder, right? So this, what is this representation learned by the encoder? These are some examples from Satskeva's paper. These are representations derived for various sentences from a model trained for machine translation. We are looking at two dimensional visualizations of high dimensional representations, which are derived using PCA. Observe how th things cluster. John admires Mary. John is in love with Mary. John respects Mary. The representations for all of these things end up in the same region. Mary admires John. Mary is in love with John. Mary respects John. These three cluster together, and these two clusters are separated. Or, you know, I was given a card by her in the garden. In the garden, she gave me a card. She gave me a card in the garden. They all mean the same thing, and their representations end up clustering. She was given a card by me in the garden. In the garden, I gave her a card. I gave her a card in the garden. These three mean the same thing again. Their representations cluster. So the hidden representation is actually learning something about the syntax and the semantics of the input. And observe something also over here. She gave me a card. I gave her a card. In the garden, she gave me a card. In the garden, I gave her a card. So even the arrangement over here, the arrangement is capturing the relative syntax. The, the grouping is going by semantics. So it's capturing both kinds of information somehow. And there are some examples or puts from machine translation also from Sotskeva's paper. This is from English to French. I don't know French, so I don't know if this is good or not, but I'm informed that it is. I have, I've had French students who told me that these examples are really good. Since I can't confirm, I'll just leave it on the slides, take a look. And if you have any uh, knowledge of French, you should probably be able to convince yourself that this is actually a pretty good response, a pretty good output. This is from a dialogue system. This is by a paper by Oren Vinyas in Kotlin. Here the human says something and the machine responds. So, the machine starts with, what is the error that you're running, please? Then the human's input is, I am seeing an error related to VPN. The sequence to sequence model's output in response is, what is the error message that you're getting when connecting to VPN using Network Connect? The human response, connection refused or something like that. The machine's sequence to sequence output is, may I know the version of the Network Connect to connect? So, this is very plausible and this is automatically obtained. It's shockingly good, right? So the, the model actually really works. So all very good. This is a nice model. It works nicely, but there's a problem. It's not really optimal. The problem is that all the information about the input sequence is now embedded into the single vector which is the hidden representation derived at the end of the input. So this one vector is overloaded with information and forced to carry all the information about the input, which is problematic. Particularly, this input sentence is very long to expect this one vector to retain all the useful information about this long input sentence is kind of unreasonable. In reality, all the hidden state values at every time carry information. And in fact, this information might get diluted as you pass them through time. And different outputs over here may relate, relate more directly to hidden representations at 
specific instance of time. For example, this ish clearly relates to I and doesn't care about apple. Both harbor and gegesen relate to it and relates to einen, right? So the uh, if you look at specific words over here, they are more dependent on some words in the input than the others. To have them all try to extract their information from just this one squished up representation is not the optimal thing to be doing. So we need a mechanism for the outputs to focus on the most relevant hidden representations of the input, not just the final one. And the solution for this is attention bubbles. To explain them, I'm going to draw things a little differently. I'll separate the encoder and the decoder for illustration. So we will represent the hidden encoder states with the symbol H. And the subscript for H is the time. So H0 is the hidden representation at time 0. H1 is the hidden representation at time 1, and so on. We are going to represent the hidden recurrent state in the decoder with the symbol S and the subscript is time. So S0, S0 is the hidden uh, decoder state at, time, at output time 0. S1 is the hidden decoder state at output time 1. I'm also going to distinguish between output time and input time because the output and input are not working on the same clock anymore, right? So now the input is processed as usual by the encoder. But instead of passing only the final hidden value to the decoder, what we will do is pass a weighted sum of the hidden state values at all the times to the decoder at every time. So at each time of the decoder, each output time of the decoder, in addition to the previous word and this recurrent state, it's going to get an additional, what we will call a context, which is a weighted sum of all of these guys. And the weights with which these guys are added, with which these things are combined, are going to be different at each output time. So does that make sense to you guys? Yes or no? I need a few yeses before I can go on, right? Okay. Yes, so you can't make the weights learnable because you don't know the length of the input. So uh, how are the weights selected? That's exactly what we're going to be working with. We want, so at each output time, we pass in, we're going to be passing in the previous, at each output time, we're going to be passing in the previous word, the recurrent state, the recurrent decoder state and a weighted sum of the inputs. And the weighted sum is going to have this formula and the weights are different for each time. And the weights must be somehow relevant to that time. So the weights, in order for the weights to know which encoder state to emphasize for the output at any time, the weights must themselves, you know, because the input could be anything, right? So the, so the weight has to figure out which encoder state to emphasize at any time. So it has to know two things. The weight is, must be a function of the encoder state. The weight for any input time must be a function of the encoder state at that time. But it must also be a function of the decoder state at that time, because clearly the weights of the inputs at this time are different from the weights for the inputs at this time. So the weights for the inputs at this time must be a function, not just of these guys, but where the system is at this time, which is encoded by the, by the previous state, right? So the weight for any, for the ith input at output time t is going to be a function of the hidden state at time i and the hidden decoder state at time t minus one. Is this making sense to you guys, this one? Questions about this one? 
anything is it because the think about this if i'm at this time two right i need to compute weights that are relevant to the second output where is the information about the fact that you're producing the second output in the in this output sequence hidden that information is here right the decoder state at this time is actually this this computation has not yet been performed so when you're trying to perform this computation you are retaining the dec you you have the decoder state current state which is this state the state of the previous time so based on this guy and these guys it must compute the weights for the input again manish the point is if i want to know what computation i must how i must weight the inputs at time t all the information about that about what is happening in the decoder is in t decoder state is t minus 1 right exactly I mean, or you can say or it could be something derived from it things get a little fancy and this is the basic model but yes uh, the basic principle is just this so is this making sense to everyone um professor yeah do the decoder states encode outputs that we already know are highly connected to the inputs for example, so if we produce so, ish, can we make the weight for I zero in later stages? So the point is this decoder state, say S1 over here, already has information about the word that you drew over here because it went in here, correct? Okay, so yeah. This decoder state has information about all the previous words. Okay, right? yeah, makes sense. So now the so, weights will be made zero for anything that was found to be very connected to the inputs. It's not going to be made zero. It's going to be small, right? Oh, so okay. what will happen? What yeah. will happen is something like this. You want the weights to have this kind of property. You want the weights to be a distribution. You just don't want these weights to keep growing as they, uh, in you know, uh, the if you don't want to have the weights to have a dynamic range, you know, to grow the total weight to grow if the input becomes long and for the weights to be smaller, the input is small. Rather, you want the weights to emphasize what is important. So you want the weights to be a distribution. You want the weights across the inputs to sum to one. A function of this kind doesn't necessarily guarantee that. So to guarantee that our weights sum to one, what we will do is a two-step computation of the weights. First, we will compute a raw function of the hidden state, hidden decoder state, and the encoder states. Then we put these raw functions through a softmax, and that softmax is actually going to give you the weight for each input type. And the actual combination that we will do is going to be done using this softmax loop. So, By this logic, again, if you do, if you take all the decoder states, that becomes variable length. You want to have a fixed length function. So you're doing a weighted sum. Again, what will happen if you do things right is that when you're decoding for ish, the weight for i will become high and the weights for the rest will become low. If you're decoding for i n, then the weight for n will become high, the weights for the rest will become low. Remember, the encoder itself could be bidirectional, right? I've drawn this left to right, but this could be bidirectional. No, this is during influence. So during inference, I'm going to be performing the encoding. I've done the encoding, and then I have an initial value S1, which could be zero, the initial value for the hidden state. And then using these for each output word, first I compute the weights for all of these hidden guys, compute the, compute the weighted sum. At time instant one, I'm going to take start of, so start of sentence and this weighted sum, produce a distribution. 
get a word that goes back in. Then I use this state to compute the compute the weights for all of these guys, produce the next weighted sum, and go back in. So Gladys, did that answer your question? Uh, uh sorry, so professor. Oh. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, you go on first. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was just wondering under this logic, we're not necessarily constrained to S T minus one, right? We could also maybe take an every S in front of it. So here's the problem. You need to want you, you want to use a fixed number of S's because yeah. this function needs a fixed number of arguments. So you can't say every S before, right? But we can maybe extend it to like two yeah. S's before. Absolutely, you could. Okay, so that's like uh, something like a heuristics that we have to change. That's a higher, a higher order recursion, right? Yeah. That's it. Okay, thank you. Gladys, what was your question? Also, it means that the weights have to be computed at every time step. Yes, the weights have to be computed at each time step. Right? Because they're dynamic. How about, right? how about like how about during training then? Where so during training, okay, we'll get to training. Give me a minute, right? We haven't yet gone to training. Okay. So, so what is this raw function? There have been many functions that have been proposed. I could just take the simplest thing is if s and h are the same size, then this raw function, which has to be a scalar, can just be the inner product. If they are different sizes. It could be a matrix in a product where this matrix W is learned. Or you can have something more complex like this, which is suggested in the first paper on attention. Or you could even have an MLP, which takes in the, this S and this H and produces a scalar value. So this, the actual nature of this function is flexible. We generally like to keep it simple and have, have a function of this kind it, because, it, because they just work. But you can get fancy. And as GRE mentioned, this function can actually even take more of the past states. So when you're performing inference, this is what happens. I'm going to have a, uh, an input. I pass it through the encoder. And I get a, get a sequence of encoder state vectors. For decoder, I'm going to initialize this hidden state, either from this final state or as a transform of it or a zero or a some fixed value. Zero seems to work just fine in, in many cases. Then using this initial state, I'm going to compute the raw weights for all of the input hidden states. And then from the raw weights, I'm going to put them through a softmax and compute the normalized weights for all of these hidden states. Then using these weights, I compute a weighted sum and then at the first time, this weighted sum, which I call the context, context vector, the start of sentence marker, and this initial state all go in, and you get the first output distribution. From that, you get a word. And then at the next time, you use this hidden state along with these weights to compute the raw, raw weights for these guys along with these hidden state values to compute the raw weights for these guys use the softmax to convert them to a distribution, compute a weighted sum, then that goes back in along with the word that you output here and the recurrent state, you get the next output distribution from which you draw a word. You can keep repeating this process till you finally draw an end of sentence marker. So, this process is just a very simple variant of the process that we saw for the simple decoder. I have a poll over here. I know I'm running over time, but this is worth it. Okay, 10 seconds, guys.
Oh, sorry. So when we take away the sum of all the eight hidden states, do we just like add them to S of zero or? So like... no, so you don't add them. That's good. That's an extra vector that goes in here. Oh, so it's a, just an extra input. So right, that's, that's what we call the context. So the attention framework computes a different context vector at each output. You're not choosing, the, you're not simply using the hidden state with the highest weight. You're using a weighted sum. So the second thing is wrong. The second, the, the second uh, question is false. The third one is true. The attention weight is a function of the hidden state representation of the word and the current decoder state. So the first one is true. The second is false and the third is true. So I have this, the rest we are mostly done. Let me just quickly go through. So again, decoding as before, the objective of drawing is to produce the most likely output that ends in an EOS. So, you know, if I were to simply draw the most likely word from the distribution here at each time, just as before, this could result in a suboptimal output. And so what we will do as before is, uh, we won't choose, we're going to retain all choices. Choices. After uh, the initial encoding and after initializing the hidden decoder state, we will compute the weights and the weighted sum of the hidden encoder states, which is the encoder context, and pass that along with the initial state and start of sentence marker to get a probability distribution. Then as before, we are going to make many copies of the network, retain only the top K, but then at the next time when we when we process uh, the, when, when the network performs its computation, it's going to take in the word, it's going to take in the previous hidden state, but it's also going to take in the, uh, the uh, weighted sum. It's going to compute a context over here. The context will be computed from this guy. So here I'll, there'll just be one. I probably don't need two of these guys, right? So the context is, is going to be computed using this state. And from using this state, you'd compute the weights, you'd compute the weighted sum. And that weighted sum is going to go in as context to both of these. And these would compute output distributions, you'd expand those out choose the top K based on the complete path probabilities. And then again, now you have two distinct contexts, right? So this context is going to be, wait, no. This context is going to be used to compute the, what am I doing? No, this guy. This guy is going to be used to compute this context vector. This guy is going to be used to compute this context vector that goes in here. And then you expand things out. So you keep doing this till you finally produce an output that ends in an end of sentence marker. So this is exactly the same uh, uh, same beam search strategy that we saw earlier. Now, so what does this attention actually learn? The key component, of course, is the attention weight, which is different for each output. The attention is supposed to capture the relative importance of each position in the input for the current output. So what does it look like? These figures show visual de depictions of the attention weights. This is from the machine translation task, English to French. And each figure, the horizontal axis represents the input, input sequence. The vertical axis represents the output sequence. So, so uh, each column, within each column, sorry, no, so within, for each row, the row shows the weights assigned to each of the input words when producing the corresponding output word. So we, we can see that to produce the first word, le, the maximum attention was given to the word, the. So the English word was the English sentence was the agreement on the European economic area was signed on August 1992 period end of sentence market right. So to output the the maximum attention was paid to the 
to output accord the maximum attention was paid to agreement for for on it became sur the became la right so you can see that the attention is perfectly fine now there's this difference between english and and french european economic area becomes zone economique european and french so the fourth word here is corresponds to area and if you look at the attention plot it actually ends up playing maximum attention to area similarly for economic it it chose the right word and the seventh word is it or the sixth word over here is european which was just the fourth word in the input and you can see that it actually chose so the the it paid attention to the correct word in the input so although the overall trend for the weights is diagonal if you plot out the weights for each word like so it actually captures the nice structural rearrangements between french and english you have multiple of these examples and if you go through these at your leisure you will find that in every case it actually does this which is really really uh pretty and then again here are some uh, translation examples from badenau's paper this is from french i can't vouch for it but i'm told that this is excellent and in fact when you use google translate you're using some variant of this model and what happened around november 2016 was google translate suddenly went from being useless to very very useful almost you know almost human and what happened in that in that one month is that they switched to this attention based model for their uh, translation and it suddenly became a very useful tool so now we are kind of at the end of our uh lecture just one final bit we've seen how a trained network can be used to compute uh outputs let's look at training itself the key challenge in training these models is computing the gradients of the derivative so when you see let's see what happens for one training instance again training instances are going to consist of input output pairs first we will perform a forward pass then and put the forward pass to the encoder then like before in the decoder we are going to pass in these contexts from the encoder and the actual target sequence of words now once again remember that in the traditional case you only passed in the input and got an output in the forward pass the target output was only used to compute divergence but here again just as for the simple translator because if you just use the standard forward pass without passing in the target output the uh, decoder can go haywire and you may not and your model won't converge so in the forward pass we will actually pass in the target output over here and the, as a result once again you're going to get a one to one correspondence between the actual outputs and the target output and then we can compute a kl divergence between the output probability distributions of the decoder and the target word sequence where you know the target word at each time is the next word in the sequence right compute the divergences back propagate and use that to update the network now back propagation over here won't just compute the derivatives for the network parameters of the encoder and decoder it's also going to compute the update the parameters for any attention function that we use to compute these attention weights gradient descent will take care of all of this now there are various tricks that can be employed to improve training convergence during the forward pass for training instead of passing the ground truth you can occasionally actually draw a sample from here and pass it in so instead of doing instead of being a theoretically theoretical purist where you only pass in an output and input and get an output and never use the target output during the forward inference or a complete uh heuristic where you pass in the entire target input target output during the forward pass as well you can do something intermediate where for some of these words 
to actually draw the word from the output distribution. So when you do this, you get to this halfway point and this and the network becomes much more robust to recover from inference errors. And also, uh, so again, the fact is, although we are passing in the ground truth label sequence here during the forward pass, we should be, we should be performing the forward inference using only the input, but doing that will not be stable. And so uh, it makes trading difficult, which is why we are passing the ground truth here. But passing the ground truth over here can make the network uh, too optimistic because when you're learning the network, it may end up lear learning to operate in a domain, in a uh, regime where it always expects the ground truth at this point. So by sampling the output at each occasionally, you sort of push it towards a more realistic operation, which is what it would perform uh, in actual inputs. So there, there are other things. The act of sampling is a non-differentiable process. So, to, so passing the gradients of the sampling backwards out here won't be possible. To make this possible, we will recast sampling the output distribution for an equivalent operation, which is computing the arg max of a gumbel distribution whose parameters are the output distribution of the network. And now the arg max can be replaced by a soft max. It makes the process differentiable uh, with respect to the network output. I won't get into this, but we explain this in greater detail in the recitation. So there have been various uh, extensions to this basic model. The most trivial one is that the encoder can now actually be both bidirectional, can be bidirectional like in the paper by Baganao. You have variations like local attention, which look at local regions of the input versus global attention. Uh, you have things like multi-head attention, explicit, or uh, and then instead of just using the hidden state directly, to compute the weights. You can use the hidden state to compute another term, which you use to compute the weights. There are many variants of the basic model that you hopefully will encounter. So one of these is this multi-head attention. So now attention-based models are currently responsible for the state of the art in many sequence conversion systems, from machine translation to speech recognition to dialogue systems, and even image processing. And here are some really impressive results from way back in 2016 in image captioning, where they applied attention to uh, image captioning. And the decoder here uses attention to decide which pixels in an image are important for each word in the caption. And check these out. So here uh, it says the dog, the caption it's generated as a dog is standing on the hardwood floor. If you look at which pixels it focused on to output dog, it's these. A stop sign is on a road. If you look at which pixels it focused on for stop sign, it is these, right? Even when you use it for images, the attention models are really able to pick out uh, the appropriate context to produce their output. And so in closing, We've looked at various forms of sequence to sequence models, which are generalizations of recurring neural networks. For more details, we have some papers linked on the course page. If not, post a link on Piazza, post a note on Piazza, we'll see if you'll post more. Uh, take a look at them, also go through Google Scholar. And if you have any questions, post on Piazza. This topic is going to appear in homework four, which is on speech recognition with attention models. So by the time you're done with homework four, you're going to be an expert on this topic. So I'll stop the recording here and I'll